Now what happens when we put our semiconductor in a solution of say iron three plus or iron two plus, or species OR? Well in that case, again the Fermi levels have to adapt. They have to approach the same. So it's not necessarily going to happen instantaneously, but within a short period of time, we have to have an equal Fermi levels in the system. So n-type and solution contact. Here's our interface. Here are species O and R. The Fermi level, again, lines up with species O and R. And what happens now is the bands do what they call a bending. They get a, we get a band bending in the system. Now the gap has not changed. And the reason we get the bending is that we see that the electrochemical potential for both phases now has to be equal, which it has to be true at equilibrium. Now if the Fermi level of the semiconductor lies above that of the solution, the electrons from the semiconductor must be transferred into the solution, okay? Because the electrons from the semiconductor have a higher energy than the solution uh, electrons. So they get transferred from the semiconductor to the solution in order to, mac uh, to, uh, to um, equilibrate the Fermi levels in the system. What that means then is that the semiconductor now becomes positively charged because some of the electrons have escaped in the solution. Now unlike in a metal where the electrons in holes are free to migrate at will, there is no barrier really to their movements. In a semiconductor there is a barrier. And so if we take some electrons away from the semiconductor, those electrons tend to, to, be, uh, to cause then a localized charge in the semiconductor. And this excess charge that now develops in the semiconductor at the interfacial region caused by the movement of electrons from the semiconductor to the solution is called a space charge. And what we happens then is that the, the energy bands tend to bend up. We have a higher energy now for the, for the conduction bands and the valence bands than we do in the bulk of the semiconductor itself. So the energy at the surface bands for the conduction and valence bands are higher than they are in the bulk because we've taken away some of the electrons and so now the, um, the interfacial region is positively charged and so there is a, what they call a space charge region Now in a metal, that space charge exists only on the surface. Remember we talked about when we have a, a, a perfect conductor, there, uh, the charge has to exist on the surface of that material. In a semiconductor, that doesn't have to be true because we don't have a perfect conduction in the, in the system. Okay, so let's, uh, we have some drawings here in the system. Perhaps it would be easier for me just to, if we could zoom in on my notes rather than me drawing all those again. Okay. Everybody ever see that or not? For the n-type system we have, here I have written space charge region, and that's again where we have an excess of positive charge. At that point we have a depletion layer. Some of the electrons have escaped into solution, and so we've depleted the local region of electrons. The net positive charge in the semiconductor. That positive charge is not localized on the surface, it actually extends into the semiconductor a certain degree. Now we can actually change that bending by adjusting the potential that we apply to the electrode itself, either through an external uh, system such as an oxidized oxide O and R uh, redox couple that's in solution, depending on the O and R redox couple potential, 
or we could use a voltage supply to change the uh, voltage at the uh, semiconductor. If the potential is greater than the flat band or the, uh, the Fermi level, um, what we call the flat band potential, then we're going to get a band, uh, bending will be up. If our potential is the same as what, the, what they call a flat band potential, which is kind of a reference point now, the bands will have no bending. They'll be the same, the conduction band will be at the same energy at the bulk and at the surface of the system. On the other hand, if our potential that we've applied is less than the flat band potential, instead of a depletion layer of electrons, now electrons will run in from solution into the semiconductor layer system and now we'll have electrons accumulating at the interface. So electrons will be present and so the bands will now bend down because now we have a net negative charge on our semiconductor. At this point, the material, the semiconductor material is gonna act a lot like a metal because there's now an excess of electrons in the conduction layer and they can move freely. There's no constraint. And so electrons can freely move in and out of the system in the, when, the, uh, when we have this bend down of the n-type semiconductor, when we have accumulation layer. A p-type system is, is analogous. Uh, in this case, we'll get an accumulation when the bands bend up because now we have an excess of holes in the system. Again, under these conditions, the bands bend up because electrons have come out of the semiconductor into the solution because we have a positive charge on the semiconductor. But in a p-type, that means that we've got now an excess of majority carriers, which are holes to begin with. So now those fill in in the, uh, in the uh, valence band and we have an accumulation layer of uh, holes. So again, in a p-type system, when the bands band up, we're gonna get a metal type conduction. Alternately, when we have a depletion, when we have the bands bending down on a p-type, then we get a depletion layer, and uh, we have a, a different, we have now more of a semiconductor type behavior. What's that space charge region? It's about 50 to 2,000 angstroms wide. And in many respects, it, it's a lot like the diffuse layer in a, um, an electrolyte. Remember we talked about the diffuse layer having some physical size and the smaller the number of ions that we had in from our supporting electrolyte, the more that diffuse layer extended out. And that's a, um, a consequence of the Poisson or Boltzmann distribution of ions. The, as we decrease the number of ions, the statistical distribution of those ions is gonna be more spread out. Same type of thing happens when we have a small number of charge carriers in the semiconductor. It's gonna spread out from the, uh, from the surface. There is a probability that there will be a certain number of charge carriers away from the surface. As we increase the number of charge carriers, the space charge region now will tend to decrease and it'll be close to zero. And when we have a metal where we have a very large number of charge carriers, the space charge region becomes almost zero. Same thing happens in a electrolyte solution. The more uh, concentrated solution we have in electrolyte, the smaller that diffuse layer is. So there's a fairly straightforward analogies between the ion concentration in an electrolyte and the carrier concentration in a semiconductor. Let's compare. For a semiconductor, we're gonna have a number of intrinsic carriers is gonna be about 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 17th cubic centimeter. And we might just call those number of, just the number of carriers. If we have a 0 0.01 molar solution of electrolyte, there's gonna be about 10 to the 19th per cubic centimeter ions in that system. And so in that case, there are more charge carriers in the electrolyte than there are in the semiconductor. And so you can see why we would have that sort of situation. Remember we talked about when we went to 0.01 to 
zero one, and we start to get a big diffuse layer, and we saw effects on the, um, of the differential capacitance. We saw those uh, Helmholtz layer type effects and the uh, Stern type effects. Same thing will happen with the semiconductor. Now because there's less charge carriers typically than the electrolyte, it turns out that the capacitance of the semiconductor is usually less than the capacitance of the double layer in the electrolyte. So the interfacial capacitance is always dominated by the lower capacitance component, and that's going to be approximately the capacitance of the space charge region on the semiconductor. And just to reiterate, when E is less than E flat band, the charge flows like met met metal electrodes. N type systems. When E is greater than the fl E flat band, again for N type systems, now unless we specifically, uh, specifically state otherwise, most of the time we're going to be talking about N type systems. So if I don't specifically say what I'm talking about, I'm talking about N type systems. But for N type systems, when E is greater than E flat band, when the bands are bent up, and we have a depletion layer of electrons near the electrode surface, there's going to be no ability to, to have current flow in and out of the semiconductor naturally. So we're going to have zero current flow. And, uh, and we're going to put an important caveat on that in the dark because remember we're talking about thermal processes. If we allow light to fall on our semiconductor, things can change, we can get photonic excitation of electrons to the, to the, to the different bands and that will change our, uh, change our tune a little bit. All right, why don't we stop right here for our break and then we'll continue uh, in a five, ten minutes or so. Okay, um, we're back from our break. Now, the, as we finish up this little bit on, on the properties of the semiconductor and solution, there's a couple of practical things I want to talk about. First of all, as we've drawn these band, band structures, it's pretty idealized. There's a couple of problems with uh, doing these experiments in uh, solutions. One very important one is the uh, process of corrosion. Um, basically, as I already mentioned earlier in, the, in today, those holes that are present in the silicon material are essentially broken bonds. And so if holes are present on the surface of the silicon, that means that there is a surface exposed broke, broken bond, which now is very reactive for solution species. And so the silicon can essentially corrode away very rapidly in the presence of excess holes on the surface. So we get silicon, basically what you'd normally get would be silicon oxides from the breakdown of water. So that's a problem with, uh, with experiments in semiconductors, particularly P-type semiconductors that have an excess of holes. Also, the surface itself is not the same as the bulk. Um, so I forget who said that, but somebody said once the surface was invented by the devil. And uh, that's where everything happens and uh, things are different on the surface than in the bulk. So all the stuff we talked about in the bulk has to be modified some other for the fact that there's different bonds are, are present. There's a set of uh, the bulk silicon bonds where you've got uh, what they call, could have dangling bonds where the silicon is exposed. So a lot of times they'll be terminated with hydrogen as particularly as, as one way to do that. They'll expose the surface to hydrogen as a plasma or something to make hydrogen terminated or in an acid solution. And so that will cause lots of different things. And what can happen, especially if you have um, dangling bonds or broken bonds or hydrogen terminated bonds, is that those can be sites where charge can accumulate that accumulates in a different way than, the, uh, than in the bulk. And those different uh, states then give rise to what they call, um, I forget the name now, 
<coughs> there's going to be the states in the band gap. So otherwise forbidden states, remember we said there's no electrons that can be present in the band gap, now can be, have electrons in there because they can be present because of these surface species. And so that's not so great. Uh, so there's going to be a difference from theoretical and reality a lot of times due to those two effects. And we can't really, we don't really have enough time to really go through all the reasons and, and how to avoid some of those things.